everyone. When any of us wants our opinions to be heard and known, we want them to be taken seriously. When you're in a public eye, the stakes of having your opinions expressed and heard, good or bad, helpful or not, are extremely high. It's easy for one's persona to be exaggerated, especially one that has been amplified by PR campaigns or skewed in a particular matter, flattering or not, uh, by certain media outlets whose primary agenda isn't necessarily to protect your reputation. So it's easy to get one-dimensionally locked into the public's mind, and it can be challenging to overcome biases or even more difficult to recover from self-inflicted mistakes. Luckily for me, I've never made a mistake. <laughs> well, you might disagree with me, that, but uh, uh, I understand from others that it can be annoying and even inconvenient if it happens. In fact, the full magnitude <laughs> the full magnitude of the consequences any of us face when we use our voices may not be fully or completely understood. In the old days, if you stood on your soapbox and belted out your opinions, likely the worst thing that would happen is that you would be ignored or your reputation may be a little tarnished by word of mouth. The freedom of speech guaranteed us in the Bill of Rights could not reasonably have predicted the awesome advances in technology that would take place within such a short period of time. The amendment should have come with a warning label, use at your own risk. The renowned author Thomas Friedman observes that when everyone has a cell phone, everyone is a photographer. When everyone has access to YouTube, everyone is a filmmaker. And when everyone is a blogger, everyone is a newspaper. And then he says, everyone is a public figure. He cautions that every parent should tell their child to be careful because everything they do leaves a digital footprint. His point, his warning, the logical conclusion extending from his prescient observation is that to some extent people, thoughtful people, are extremely vulnerable and perhaps should be genuinely afraid to speak, afraid to act, afraid to be ourselves. And this, more than just being a sad state of affairs, as a new reality, is fundamentally dangerous. Dangerous beyond our own individual safety. This moment we are living in, the tsunami of information and access and universality, with its knee-jerk hyper-overreaction and seriously deficient analytical consideration of events and their consequences, this information technology era, with all of its promise and opportunity for growth and development, can actually represent a clear and present danger to the so-called marketplace of ideas. Because the important ones, the ones that can affect real change and improve the status quo, are quickly identified and ruthlessly attacked by entrenched forces whose interests are worth protecting at all costs. For the moment, it may be a vague and nascent danger for many people. It is already, though, quite perilous for those in the national or international limelight, including, in particular, celebrities, one subgroup of which is actors. Of course, it is right to be held accountable for our actions, and to the extent that what we say has an appreciable impact on others, it is prudent and necessary to be both, skepti both skeptical and open-minded when subjected to the views of any public speaker, including the musings and sometimes ramblings of a hobbit who was too small to get on the Shire football team. <laughs> <laughs> and they have something to say. And so I come to Johns Hopkins, full of optimism and enthusiasm and caution. I'm eager to relate some of my acting experiences and offer you some of my thoughts about leadership and a bit about fellowship. It's <laughs> 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 a title of the movie, we got it! Goonies, Rudy, and Lord of the Rings are three films, actually five if you set them fellowship that you tell me. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, <laughs> the themes remain meaningful and relevant. Yes, Doug from 51st Date and Dave Morgan from Encino Man are timeless classics destined to be studied for years at the Smithsonian. <laughs> but cavemen and spandex shorts are not the reason I was invited to speak here tonight. Well, maybe the reason I was brought here was peace tonight, but I hope not, because I have this whole thing on leadership put together. So here goes <clears throat> my vision. It is. <laughs> Heard it yet? It's a good vision. <laughs> Craziness. It's my.
my dad's not heckling from the front row. <laughs> so here goes my vision. It has been said that every school in America should be a palace. I couldn't agree more. Every student should have the opportunity to attend a glorious institution like Johns Hopkins University. Every graduate should have a great job waiting for them, and our economy should thrive as everyone lives a full and enjoyable life with recreation and relaxation and contributing the most productive parts of our work lives to the betterment of society, creating products of value that are environmentally sustainable as we preserve the millions of delicate species around us, attempting to resolve conflicts around the world and continuing to explore the known universe. We should all have awesome playlists designed for us by the coolest people. And we should be able to eat all the food we want with impunity and have free memberships to gyms and safe cars that go 100 miles an hour and jetpacks and... Oh, I'm sorry. Where was I? Ah, yes. I have something to say. Everyone has a role to play. As a child being raised in a family of performers, I thought I knew what this meant. Shakespeare writes, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. Everyone has a role to play. Generally, the lessons that I've learned as an actor, and from the roles I've played, have been very useful to me beyond the realms of film and television. Everyone has a role. <laughs> Pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> Everyone has a role to play. I first really heard this phrase applied powerfully and directly to my life in the middle of 2003. During that year, right before Operation Iraqi Freedom began, I was appointed to President Bush's Council on Service and Civic Participation. The mission of the council is to promote a culture of volunteerism and civic engagement. I don't think the administration had seen 51st States. <laughs> it was... Uh, <laughs> uh, he was a nonpartisan appointment, and while I did not vote for him, I was proud to be asked to serve my country in such an important way. I had already been serving for eight years as a civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army, appointed by President Clinton, actually by Secretary of the Army, Togo West, who was appointed by President Clinton, who I did vote for. <laughs> I don't think he or the army had seen toy soldiers. No. <laughs> yeah, all right. Get older. Uh, anyhow. <laughs>